Hello and welcome to the Spark of Ages podcast. I'm your host, Rajiv Parikh. I'm the CEO and founder of Position Squared, an amazing growth marketing company based in Silicon Valley. So yes, I'm a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, but I'm also a business news junkie and a history nerd. I'm fascinated by how big, world-changing movements go from the spark of an idea to an innovation that reshapes our lives. In every episode, we do a deep dive with our guests about what led them to their own eureka moments and how they're going about executing it, and perhaps most importantly, how they get other people to believe in them so that their idea could also become a spark for the ages. This is the Spark of Ages podcast. In addition to myself, we have our producer, Sandeep, who will occasionally chime in to make sure we don't get too in the weeds with tech jargon. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep it honest here. I'm going to keep it, keep it on the level, as the kids say. Today's guest is Scott Saslow. Scott Saslow is the founder and CEO of the Palo Alto, California-based One World Investments, which provides investment capital and advisory services to help organizations scale social impact. One World also manages an early stage impact investing fund. Over his career, Scott has been a founder or founding team member of seven startup businesses. Prior to founding One World, Scott was the founder and CEO of the Institute of Executive Development or ExecSite, supporting executives in global 2000 organizations, including American Express, BlackRock, Intel, Time Warner, and the U.S. Navy. Well, yep. Scott also worked for Siebel. I don't think you've heard. Have you heard of Siebel? I haven't heard of Siebel. They were eventually Sorry. acquired. He was in diapers. Yeah. And Microsoft <laughs> Corporation in leadership roles. Scott is a graduate of my favorite business school, Harvard Business School, and Northwestern University. There are a few. There was just that one. It happens. There's, there's more. He got his MBA and a BA in economics at Northwestern. MBA from Harvard. He has authored over 25 articles for publications such as Forbes uh, and Directorship and has been interviewed and quoted in Harvard Business Review, Bloomberg, and Business Week. Scott, welcome to the Spark of Ages. Glad to be here. And just so you guys know, most of that is kind of true. That's what we want to we, get to is what's, what's You not. had ChatGPT do your bio for you <laughs> and didn't right. fact check it? Is it that what happened? Hallucination. Not yet, but when we dial out, that's what's up. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I'm really happy to have Scott here because he has such a wide ranging set of experiences and he's taught me a lot about social impact investing. And so I'm, I just love to share all that with you. What I'm really excited about learning Scott is what you're doing most recently. I think you mentioned that you are about to release a new book in the next month. Tell us about it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. The book is really exciting. The book is in part my own story, but that it's also reflective of 20, 30 some folks that I interviewed. The title of the book is Building a Sustainable Family Office. For those that may not know, a family office is generally the infrastructure, the people and the process and the, the, the legal entities that a wealthy person will set up to help them manage their wealth. But it does a whole bunch more than that. It does investing in accounting and taking care of taxes and estate planning. It's also where families will generally house their philanthropic activity. So if they have a family foundation or if they're using a donor advice fund, and it also supports the family in various ways. So these are just as kind of a, a, as a student of business, I find these business entities very interesting. There's a small number, something on the order of 10,000 in the world. They represent the order of $6 trillion in total wealth, which is a big number. That's a huge number. It, slightly. Slightly yes. huge, but it, it's actually <laughs> less than 10% to what that number will grow to in the next two decades. Interesting. Whoa. So the point is, this is a small but yet very powerful group of investors and individuals and families. And I thought it'd be really interesting to dig into them and understand what makes them tick, how can they be more efficient? How can they be sustainable in terms of their ability to be effective and lasting organizations? So is this like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Like this is that kind of thing? Uh, at the very top of the scale, sure. The Gates and you know the, the billionaires of the world. And it includes a lot of other investors that may not be household names, but they've accumulated wealth through some way, some you know form of another. And they're trying to figure out how to best manage that. There's a whole bunch of other elements that go into trying to manage and grow family offices that make them 
not very sustainable. And that's really where the idea of the book came from is, you know, these are entities that often will kind of crash and burn. We've witnessed a whole bunch of these. And so I find the topic fascinating and kind of intellectually interesting on one level. It's also related to the work of One World. My belief is the more healthy these family offices can be, the more likely they will be efficient and generous as it relates to their own philanthropy, as it relates to their own impact and sustainable investing. So that's how it ties to that broader one. It's a really interesting intersection because most people would not, like, one of the things we like talking about is great innovators, right? And so to fuel that innovation, first of all, there's innovators in the sense that a lot of these folks, they, a lot of, they build a lot of wealth, whether it's in traditional businesses or in something that we've never heard of or never built before, and it turns into something. I think family offices typically start at people who've built about a hundred to $200 million in wealth. About right. Yeah. Something like that. And then it just goes up from there. They're looking for a way to manage that money so that they can do what they want to do afterwards and have somebody professionally manage it. Or it can be a way for them to fuel their ambitions in terms of putting that money towards areas of interest for them. And that includes potential impact investing or social investments or charitable investments. It's a way for them to to push that in. So the seven trillion dollars that you say is going to grow to 70 84, 84. 84 trillion dollars, right? Seven trillion. If you look at it compared to the US economy, that's about a third of the yearly US economy, right? US is about over 20 plus 20 plus trillion dollars. So that's a big chunk of that. And so there's a lot of money that's being put to work that could be put to work in more innovative ways than the typical pension fund investing or endowment investing or even personal investing. That's exactly right. And so it, it's really up to the principals or the owners of this capital and these offices to figure out not only how they want to invest, sometimes they're very keyed into it. And then other times, quite honestly, they're not. They'll hire someone and say, show me some great numbers, show me some great returns. That's all I really need you to do. There's other investors, and I fall in the latter camp, where I'm actually really keen to know how are those dollars being used? Who's making money from my money? How are they making money? Am I in agreement with that? Does that kind of align with my values? And I'm someone who wants to push it as far as I can. I understand the role that philanthropy has, the nonprofit sector and and philanthropic dollars to support a lot of that activity. That's huge. We need to support that as much as we can. But the real dollars, I think what we learned in business school, you know, what is the Willie Sutton rule? You know, why did he rob banks? That's where the money is. So the real (laughs) money is in the public markets and the capital markets. Right. And if you could influence how those dollars are invested, how they move around, if you could influence how companies think about their own mission, this gets into some of the topics around ESG investing, which I know has been politicized just like everything everything else <laughs> i think i read today that water has been politicized water literally yeah. everything which is a bit of a shame but that aside you know it, it's really this notion that dollars as an investor yes you can and should get a return for your investment yeah but i think that's really just table stakes if you say I, i'm just looking for a return then you can do kind of like warren buffett says well what would you advise your family to do with your wealth he's like well i'll put it in a bunch of you know stock index funds. Now, of course, what he's doing is he's doing the giving pledge where he's going to give over 50 or probably 90% to to all kinds of foundations, including the Gates Foundation. So he's actually going to put that money to work to help other folks. I think what you're getting at is I can take money and I can put it in the S&P 500 or a bunch of different index funds and let it run passively. Or I can do something really clever and innovative. And I think that's what That's, I think, some of what's guiding you, right? I think you have access to family office as well, and you've talked to so many of them, and there's more they can do. And many of them, many of the folks that who've been at these family offices, they come from, like, there's the original, uh, the original one that creates the wealth, and then they say, hey, what else can we do? We can really make a difference with this. Let me help you do that. So I think you have a lot of stories like that. And so that is the whole notion. And really, you know, sustainable investing, that's probably the umbrella term that includes other types of, you know, values aligned investing, if we want to use that that kind of phrase or concept. That is both in public markets, that's certainly in private markets. Sometimes in the private markets, that's specifically referred to impact investing, where you're actually funding a for-profit business that's building a solution to a problem, a social problem, environmental problem. 
you're actually developing some sort of way to deal with with an issue that that the capital owner cares about. But my point is, it's even there are opportunities really across all asset classes. So that's in real estate, that's in the public equities, that's in the credit markets, and so you know that's something that One World is trying to do with the capital base that we have, which is relatively my, modest. We're saying, what are all the ways we can support sustainable investing? And the key thing for us, this is really important, is we believe there are opportunities to do this, and, and we have proven this thus far in a non-concessionary way. What is, what's a concession? I see Sandeep's very confused. He's giving me that kind of furled eyebrow I, I, I thought I thought uh, concession, yep. I, Sandeep with yep. unicorns <laughs> and peanuts at a game. Is that what concessions are? Yeah, yeah it's Big League Chew, right? May I offer <laughs> <y'all>, Cracker Jacks? <laughs> May I offer an alternate definition? No. So the notion is basically, as an investor, you given the amount of risk that you want to take on, you need to be compensated for that risk. And there are, it is a true statement that there are some sustainable and some impact investments that are what's called concessionary. They do not meet the market rate. If the market rate in a given asset class might be 8% or 15% or 4%, you, you may achieve that minus something, concession, some sort I'm giving. Instead of the 4%, I'm getting 3%. The mm-hmm. reality is a subset of all the sustainable investing that happens is actually designed to be concessionary and is done at a concession, meaning the majority is non-concessionary. You're actually hitting the rates that you get. And this is really important because I do think the first wave of sustainable investing and supporting these kind of impact companies and whatnot, there's those that believed kind of on moral grounds, this was a good thing to do. You know, we have a responsibility, we need to make the world better, or I care about, you know, issues X, Y, and Z. I want to both be an investor, but also make a difference through this money, not just get a return. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that philosophy. But my point is, I think the first wave of impact and sustainable investors weren't as financially sensitive to the return they're getting. We're now at a point in the public markets, the statistic I think I've most recently heard is we're up to about a third of all publicly managed capital is being invested in some sort of sustainable strategy. So what are some examples of that, Scott? Well, I mean, it might be something around the environment, right? You say, okay, look, one of the causes I care about is climate change and dealing with companies. So therefore, I want to either, as an impact investor, invest in companies that are tackling climate change. Maybe it's an innovative carbon capture technology. It's putting carbon into cement and it's allowing, still being done as a business. This isn't a nonprofit but it's something that we believe achieves both kind of is a good scalable business, but also has some sort of environmental impact, or maybe it's something related to healthcare or public education. There are really a variety of causes or ways that dollars can be put to work to do both, to both serve as a good investment. And and the point I was just making was it's really important. We're at a stage now, and and that's why I share that one third statistic where it's really becoming more mainstream and For that to continue, investors need to see this is not a money-losing proposition compared to what I might be able to get with a traditional investment. So that is not only the way in which we're trying to do that with the relatively small capital base we have, but we're trying to actually be kind of good advocates for this practice that sustainable investing can and is being done in ways where there's no financial law. Lo- in fact, some would say it can be additive. It could be better, right? You should be able to do better. It shouldn't be this concessionary notion where you make less. It should actually be better, right? And you've been investing in some of these companies. I, you want to, you know, you want to list a couple of your favorites? But the ones that I think are doing some really interesting things that we'll hear a lot more of. One is in the Bay Area, in the East Bay, in Oakland. It's called Lilac Solutions. And they've developed a process by which they can refine lithium from these kind of salt brines where lithium as a mineral exists. Typically, it's a very cumbersome, environmentally hazardous, expensive, long process to mine lithium. They've developed a way to do that much more efficiently. It uses one-tenth the water. And lithium, as we know, is very key for the transition to electric batteries, non-polluting vehicles, and powering the whole electric economy. Right. I'm not allowed to put them in my checked luggage. <clears throat> exactly. Yes. Be yeah. careful where you pack them. Good. Thank <laughs> you, Sandeep. Yeah. Good point. 
So that's just a fun one, kind of on the more technical side. We've also gotten excited over the years in sustainable food, right? Our food systems, I think, need a lot of innovation to be more healthy for everyone involved, from the farmers to the planet to the people eating the food products. So we've supported sustainable food products over the years, some alternative protein type companies, crickets. <laughs> the Great crickets. pizza topping. Sandeep is Great pizza topping. saying, where are my crickets? <laughs> Cricket Cricket crickets. Is- I saw an investment recently where by investing in a special a company that knows how to make black flies at scale, you can use that as meal for shrimp and there's going to be a huge protein shortage. This is a way to lower the cost and higher volume shrimp production because there are fewer diseases coming out of it. So it's kind of a quadruple win. I never knew that we needed to produce more black flies. That's insane. Um, Okay. Can can I ask, can I I step back a little bit and just ask Scott, what's a day in the life of Scott Saslow? There's probably some combination of the following. It's never in the same order, right? Especially these days, it has been very much focused on the book. The book is about three weeks from being launched. So that's, we're in the final stages there. And over the last couple of quarters, that's been probably 30 some percent, 40% of the portfolio of my kind of time portfolio. Another third is probably related to the early stage investing. So that's either looking at new opportunities to invest in, speaking with and thinking about the existing portfolio and which of those are looking to do follow-on financings and which of those we want to participate in. So I'd say that's another chunk of activity. And then I'd say the third bucket is probably more of a general bucket related to my own family office and managing that. So that's coordinating with some of the other professionals we work with, whether that's on the investment side or the legal side or the accounting, there's always plenty to do there. All these different things every day, you know, towards all the different areas that you're looking at. What are the problems that you see with impact investing that you and One World are working on today? as part of that day in the life? Yeah. Well, I think this first problem, if you will, is this broader misunderstanding I alluded to earlier, that impact investing equals concessionary. Or impact investing, oh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of like philanthropy, right? You know, that's a common- Great way for me to lose money. Exactly. Or maybe Uh I'll just get my money back. I'll get my money back and I'll do some good. Thank you. So that puts you in a different world when it comes to how you think about how you invest, right? It's a pseudo philanthropy slash investing thesis. Well, it, look, I, I think it's great that there's consent, just like I think there, it's wonderful and there'll always be pure philanthropy. You know, you give money to a cause or an organization and you know you're not going to get any financial return. That's existed since the start of time and that and we should put as much resources behind that as we can. I also think that concessionary where it's not market rate investing is a good thing for those investors that have the appetite and desire and say, look, I, I want to do this. I like supporting for-profit businesses that are tackling solutions. In addition to, you know, every impact investor is probably also a philanthropist. But where I get most excited and where I'm trying to kind of make a change is to say, especially to wealth owners that haven't ventured into impact or sustainable investing, it can be done without the concessionary part. So if that's your hang up that you're like, no, 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 I must hit my, you know, if, if, if it's a fixed income, you know, it needs to be 4% or if it's, you know, developing markets that, you know, I need a certain percentage that that there are opportunities to do that. Now that's kind of can be hard to find the opportunities. It's not as, you know, prevalent as your quote mainstream in investments or the opportunities that you might see. I mean, the founding story of One World, there was, I think back to, it was 2015, and I was speaking to a really bright woman, a recent grad out of Stanford Business School, and she was talking about her startup. Her startup was really designed to tackle climate change by helping ranchers that have these huge grasslands, innovative ways for the ranchers to rotate the cattle that were feeding on the grasslands And doing it in a more efficient way would greatly help to sequester carbon in the grasslands. It was very kind of simple idea, but something really difficult in practice to pull off. And she was approaching it from a software perspective. She felt this is a data problem. We know how, where this data lives right now in a bunch of silos, this, that, and the other. We're going to pull together. We're going to build a business. I know these ranches will pay for it because they'll be more productive. They'll make more money. This isn't asking them to do a favor. 
But the point was, here was this really great entrepreneur with this really interesting business idea. And I said, oh, well, yeah, you're a recent grad. It's 2015. It's raining money here in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Times must be good. And she's like, yeah, all my classmates, that's exactly what they're saying. It doesn't matter what they're doing. They're getting money thrown at them. But for me, some investors are turned off by the idea that I'm trying to both build a business, but I also have this environmental goal that I'm trying to kind of think about and solve for. And to me, that really seemed, I mean, both a shame from a societal perspective, but also like, a, like there's money on the table. There needs to be a better way for great entrepreneurs like you, Christine, and investors out there like me and many others that I know that are looking for these opportunities. So that's really been, you know, one of the things that we tried to do over the years with One World is connect entrepreneurs and investors in new and innovative ways. And I think there's just mm. um, great ways to connect them. Wealth of ideas to put all this yeah. together, really. So you're connecting the dots. You're the guy that's going, all right, there's all this money out there in family offices that we need to val uh, align their values with these entrepreneurs that are doing these great things to help the world. Th this is correct. Basically. Yeah. The book is not quite at that level because the book is actually taking a step back and saying, look, before family office X, Y, or Z, you can, you know, and it's your call, right? I am never going to tell anyone what they need to be doing or should be doing with their funds. But the point is the biggest concern that family offices have is how to keep the work that they're doing and the wealth they've created and the good fortune they've been part of, how to keep that going, how to have the subsequent generations participate in that, how to have them um, also be wealth creators, not just be inheritors and take the money and you know buy a bunch of houses, but do something meaningful with that. Mm -hmm. So that is something that every family office I've ever come in contact, which is now you know got to be north of a hundred. Mm -hmm. They all have this concern. They're terribly scared about spoiling their children. Right. They realize that they're in a unique situation and they're going to be treated very differently than a lot of other people, and they don't really like that to a large degree. Uh -huh. So they're happy and proud about the wealth they've created. They want to be generous and share with their family. They do not want their kids spoiled at all. They'll do anything to avoid that. To the, I mean, and what you see is that they quite honestly and, and often will lie <laughs> and hide the wealth, not even mm, tell about wow. it until they're 40, 50, 60 kind of thing. Right. To make them work for it, to make them feel like, because I think a lot of them, they earned it on their own. They created some business, some idea, and they grounded and pounded and made it happen. And yep. they don't want their kids to feel like, wow, it's so, life is so simple. I just have to do a couple of things. And I think that's, they Ab feel that Absolutely. Way. Not let them get this idea that, hey, I can just like coast because I have this big money right. cushion to fall back on. But by the same token, sometimes that practice can backfire and there can be a lot of lost opportunity for the broader family. So in any event, the, the point is what I wanted the book to do is just start from the perspective of, look, the, you know, any given family, you have some, whatever the level of wealth might be, how do you maintain that, right? That's the table stakes. You want to maintain that, but you also want to have a mission for your wealth and your family office. You want to think about what's the purpose of it it's okay. You're not a bad person if you say, you know, well, my number one concern is is me and my kids and I, I want to have money and we want to go to nice resorts and, you know, buy nice things. Right. That's okay. You, you know, you, mm -hmm. you've earned that. But the point is that's table stakes. Let's take it to the next level. What else could you be doing that would really engage your kids? Your next, you know, the next gen, they're, they're millennials or Gen Z. Well, let me tell you, this whole notion of sustainable investing, that really resonates with them. And if you're not doing some of that, I'm not saying, you know, go jump in head first if that's not for you, but you might want to try it. So the thinking is, let's take a step back because you said like, I think about 30% of them fail after 40%, 40% uh, every fail. time it's passed in a generation. So it survives, mm. they, it yep. gets Flip further away. Yep. And so instead of furthering it away, let's have some more purpose behind it. Let's at least design it so it doesn't just disappear. And I think you're taking a lot of what you've learned because part of one of your earlier startups was in the area of executive development, executive leadership. So in part of that, you're driving, helping people understand their purpose and then driving that into action. And, it's, and it sounds like you're melding together these multiple experiences. You also, well said. your family has a family office. You also have, you know, you've been 
with entrepreneur, a lot of entrepreneurs. You've also done executive development and now you're also in impact investing, which people have impact investing as well as uh, philanthropy. So you've seen all sides of this and you're bringing it all together in this book. Exactly right. And it's interesting. I mean, back in the family to the family office conversation, the learning aspect that they can be um, benefiting from, the learning journey that these offices can, some of them do, but many of them, I think it's still an opportunity for them. It's really interesting to put on my learning and development hat and look at it from that perspective and say, okay, what are the skills and capabilities they need? How do they develop that? I think we're going to see a lot more of that going forward. And yeah, to your point, ultimately it's in service of achieving what you want to achieve out of that pool of resources. So I imagine it's got to be tough to be persuading family offices to allocate the capital in this in certain ways, right? Like it's gotta be tricky. So what's, let's say, what's your advice to say a social entrepreneur seeking capital from, from them? Is it really tough? And then how do they get to it? Right. So family offices will not be told how to invest. Typically they're very savvy business people, leaders, thinkers, investors. No one, especially me, will come and say, hey, you need to do this. You need to invest this way or that way. The book is not about, you know, this is how you should invest your money. The book is about how do you keep your family office healthy and sustainable and build it right. so it's built to last. That's exactly what the book does. And I think what's in large demand. To your question, maybe more pointedly, when they decide, if and when, a family, and I think the research shows somewhere between 40 and 50% of family offices are already supporting sustainable investing in some way, shape, or form. Maybe they're not doing it across the whole balance sheet. Maybe they've chosen a few asset classes. They've said, because of my next gen, we're doing, a, we're doing some impact investments. And that's a great way for me as the older principal and my 20-something or 30-something to work on something together. We have fun where it's about entrepreneurship. You can relate to it, et cetera. That's a, that's a great technique, one of many. But what I would say is, look, I mean, family offices, they most of them care pretty deeply beyond things just around how do I get a return and how do I file my taxes on time and so forth. So it's a question of finding out what are their interests, right? If you're in contact with a, a principal directly, you can ask them, you know, what are things they care about? What are things they work on? How are they tackling it through philanthropy? How are they perhaps already tackling it through investing and using the for-profit you know, business model? Ellen? So will they find you because they already have a fund out or they already have an initiative through various organizations? Or do you as an, a budding entrepreneur or someone who's built something go looking for them? How, how would I access it if I'm an entrepreneur? Well, so how do you crack the family office market is the question. So- mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it it can be a little tough. I've actually written about this on Impact Alpha and a few other places. You will start to meet individuals who either work as a principal at a family office or work as a, an executive, a hired individual who is out there looking for opportunities. You can build relations and try to understand what's their timeline. How do they want to be involved? Typically, just like any investor class, I think family office principals love beyond the dollar support. So they can really find a win-win. Let's say there's a, a family office that made its initial, initial source of money was through real estate. If you're a real estate business seeking capital, you don't just want their capital from that family office. You want their expertise, knowledge, networks, contacts, and so forth. So I'd say that's another key thing with any investor type. Understand mm -hmm. what are all the, the levers that a given family office has to pull because the family will certainly be more excited where they can not only write a check, but then maybe be involved or lend their expertise, help to socialize, that sort of thing. But it can be tricky. Arguably, most family offices tend to be pretty closed off and they want to stay private. So there's not this listing of here's all family offices and their, and their, <laughs> and their interests. I, I met a person the other day who family made a lot a significant wealth in real estate and they were interested in agricultural technology. So they created a $30 million seed fund. They, they are just running their own venture fund. I ran into yep. another one where instead of making the normal returns you make by diversified investment, they're interested in helping buyouts of certain types of companies, right? And they just, they're leaders of those office, go look for them, go look for these things. So a lot of times you may just be searching for places as an entrepreneur, places to go, and you're just going to what may be a fund and that fund may happen to be 
back, totally backed by a family office. Could be, or indirectly. I, I read the statistic that one in ten dollars into all startups come from family offices. It's true. Not directly. A lot of them are indirect, right? Because family mm -hmm. offices invest in funds, which then invest in startups. So yeah, family offices do play a major role in entrepreneurship already. But granted, it can be a little tricky to actually identify a specific one. What do you think about the generational differences? Are you seeing that in terms of how this plays out? Boomers versus millennials, Gen Z? In terms of how they manage the capital, how they manage the family office sort or, of thing? or how they even think about manage the capital, how they think about their purpose, how they end up guiding the, the whole story together. Because you were saying a lot of people, some people don't even know that their family has great wealth till 40 or 50 years old. So, I mean, I think you've actually run across some of these younger folks who do get involved and then do make a difference as part of trying to drive impact for their family office. Yeah, it's true. So I'd say there's, number one, a trend toward being more open and involving more the younger generation. I think it was more, you know, kind of the the older generation. You know, I think about my father and his generation. My father was born in the Depression, okay? And then he went on to become a successful businessman, but he came from pretty modest means. And I think his attitude around sharing, communicating that wealth to my family, myself and my two siblings was a little bit driven by, you know, his circumstance and what shaped him as a young kid. And I'm, I'm sure he felt like, well, okay, the family's doing well now that that is true, but that could change. I mean, he saw how quickly things can change and, you know, people were wiped out in a heartbeat, right? And they didn't know it. And all of a sudden this wave came. Absolutely. I just spoke with another family office based up in Seattle they were a fourth generation family business in the real estate, and they were very fortunate to have sold the family business right before the 2008 crash. Wow. And so had they not, it would have been a very different story. So I, I guess the point is the older generation is more, they have the perspective that money comes, money goes, don't get too used to it kind of thing, which I think is healthy to a large degree. But I also see younger kind of 20-somethings, 30-somethings to the extent that they're involved in their family office, and some are, some aren't. They're very keen to see how the dollars can do both, right? Can provide a return that makes the financial managers happy and the other members of the office happy. Okay, we're getting a return, but that it's also some sort of purpose behind it some sort of way to support the causes that they care about. Do you ever get into this thing where there's like the, you know, like, so Sandeep and I deal this, think about this with our parents, right? They are immigrants from India. They came here with very little. They're used to saving everything. They never throw mm -hmm. away anything. The ultimate yeah. pack rats. And we're more like, oh, well, we've seen life a little differently. <laughs> we're more likely to spend on some things. We'll fix more things. You know, like we're, we're willing to do that. I think it's that we value time as money. Time as money. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas our parents' generation is like, no, no, money as money only and don't value time at all. They'll spend five hours on the phone, right? Trying to get a $20 discount off their flight. Yes. <laughs> or sign that up kind for of credit card offers to get free miles. So, That's how they're wired. Well, they love that. It's amazing. about the older generation. They though, are right? so scrappy and clever. But is there this thing where you run into it related to this topic, which is like saving it versus giving it away? And there's that tension between these offices, between the, the key members of the office? You know, it's interesting. I think that you are seeing some examples. There's a few very kind of public examples of family offices where they've decided not only do we want to give a significant proportion of the wealth away, we want to do that during our lifetime. Maybe you've heard of this concept of a drawdown mm -hmm. foundation yeah. where it's like, no, 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 not when I die and I'm 60 or I'm 80. Like, I, I want to start doing it now and get the pleasure and the benefit of doing that now and, and mm -hmm. create good for the world today, not in 40 years, like the climate or education system. You know, we need that today. We need those dollars. So you are seeing some examples of that, which is great. You know, in Silicon Valley, I think one of the trends that seems to have gained a little bit of traction in certain crypto and other kind of crowds here, this kind of, uh, what is it, effective altruism, this notion that, well, we're going to focus really hard on working and, and making a lot of money. And then, and then one day we're going to give it away. Yeah. I don't know. I'm a little suspect toward that. <laughs> I think sometimes that kind of sounds like they're just justifying not doing anything 
Society it's today. Like the, it's like the chase for the sake of the chase. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I'm like Don't really focused on making money at all costs today. So yeah. You see that building in the university? It's going to have my name on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <all>. So <laughs> I, I'm careful not to judge too much with some of these trends and whatnot. They, Don't worry, Scott. I can. <laughs> exactly. I'll be neutral. You'll do the dirty work. I think there is some of that tension, right? And it makes sense because the people are coming from different circumstances, right? Now, when you think about not just your book and all these different businesses that you've started, I'm going to go more towards the thing that we care about at Position Squared, which is go to market. Okay. So let's talk a little bit of go to market, just a little bit. You've seen so many different companies and how they go to market, right? Across different types of businesses. But even in your own initiatives, you've done your own go to market, right? How do you, because you're building a network, a multi sided network. What did you do and what did you feel like worked? What experiments worked for you? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I, I realize kind of now in retrospect, I, and maybe, maybe it's a Libra. I'm, that's my zodiac sign, a Libra. Libra. So balance. Makes I, so in these kind of like two sided marketplaces, I, I really believed in trying to serve that role well and try to do it in such a way that it's kind of beneficial to both sides and that I wasn't, you know, seen as, let's say, yet another provider, I was trying to do something kind of to build the marketplace where everyone, everyone kind of wins. And I don't know, I guess I enjoyed trying to, and, and probably quite honestly, why did I try to do that in a few different businesses? It was this notion that, you know, that that's how you get more scale, right? If you can not just be yet another provider, but you can actually do something for the whole ecosystem, that's pretty cool. So, I mean, you know, back to the impact investing. Yes, we are an impact investor. We take money and we put it into for-profit social and environmental impact companies. However, we try to do, and, and you know this, Rajiv, you, you guys and Position Square has been great supporters over the years of a lot of the events and the programming and the community building. So it's more than just like, we're a fund, we're going to kind of you know, heads down, not really share with anyone else what we're doing and just try to eke out the best percentage. That That's, you know, I, I'd say how some investors, that's their point of view. And if it works for them, great. But we're more like, hey, let's be collaborative. Let's bring in more people, more people. You know, yeah, maybe I'll bring in more investors and I'll actually, I'll, I'll remove a seat from myself at a table or, you know, on the cap table of a company kind of thing. But it's still good for the overarching industry. So I'd say it's that it's, it's, it's saying like, not only, you know, how can we be like a player on the field, proverbial field, but how do we, how do we do something that all the players benefit from? Uh, lately I've noticed you have a podcast to talk about your book, right? You're finding folks who've built, who have purpose as well as building their family office. So it's a really I think you, in general, it sounds like that's your, your favorite approach is the community approach over the heads down, just pumping down a list and chasing folks and getting them on Zoom calls. Exactly. I think that's a good observation. And then the other, I suppose, is I always like this idea of trying to own a niche and really like find something that you feel you do really well depends, right? If your ego and your personality type is like, I want to be in the big pond and big visibility, then that may not work. And there's part of me that feels that way and operates that way. But I think more so I'm very comfortable, like a true entrepreneur, like I'm going to be doing something that might feel a little weird, wacky, different black sheep. I'm going to be like way over here, but you know what, if I can actually get good at that. And, and if that's an area that happens to grow a little bit in importance, then I mean, in 2015, sustainable investing and all that. That was not um, well known. I mean, that's for sure. And some of that's luck. It's not like, oh, it was genius. I saw the trends, you know. But I was like, that, that's a space that I just think is really cool. So I always think that that's kind of good advice to, to anyone is just like find something that you really get excited about. Find a way to become really good at, you know, some sliver of it where you're that, you know, you're that person or you're that firm. I think you've talked a lot about what sparks you, but if there is a person, a historical event, a person or a movement that inspires you today, who or what would that be? Well, honestly, this might sound a little corny, but like a lot of one world and what was behind that was 
my kids, I have two daughters, you know, one's in middle school, one's in high school. And, and in 2015, when I started my work in this whole area, they were still pretty young, but I, it, you know, like anyone who's had kids will say, those are life changing events and they change your perspective on you and your purpose on this earth and how much time you have left on this earth and all those issues in a really healthy way. And so a lot of one world I think is, you know, not just for my two kids, but it's kind of like for that generation and the next generation. And, you know, we've referred to it a few times today, the millennials and Gen Z, they just seem to be wired in a way where they are very concerned about finding purpose in their life. They're very concerned about the environment. They're very concerned about companies and jobs that where they can have their cake and eat it too. Yes, a job and it's challenging and it's interesting, but it's also making a difference. Maybe I'm a young soul as opposed to an old soul. Like I, I really resonate with that generation and I hope they, you know, I hope they kind of keep it up and that those ideals don't kind of fade away as they maybe hit their thirties. Their- so is there a person that captures that for you? Greta Thunberg the activist, the environmentalist from, I think it's Sweden, the young environmentalist. It's not just her as an individual, but again, kind of that younger generation. Someone, in her case, it's really, I think, inspiring. Here you have a pretty young individual who was really able to bring a lot of attention to the issues that you know she cared about. I mean, in a pretty unapologetic way. And a very inspiring way. So yes, uh, here's to you, kiddo. <laughs> yeah, we That's stand. We amazing. stand, Greta. That's pretty amazing. <sighs> Was one before we go to our game. I have one more question. I'm always trying to discover: is a person motivated to do what they're doing today by what they did as a child, or did they did as you go through it come upon what you did? Did you have a grand plan at 15, 14, 12? I was always, yes and no. So I always loved the idea of being in business. I think, you know, even when I was in high school, I knew I wanted to work in business and go to business school in particular. I chose my college specifically because it did not have a business school. It was a liberal arts college and I was an economics major, the discipline science, as they say. But I chose that because I I did have kind of this game plan, what a nerd I was, and still am, to be honest. Whatever, 17, I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I want to go to like a liberal arts, and then I'm going to go get an MBA. I love the idea of becoming kind of a professional, again, at whatever it was I'm choosing. Now, that said, I had no idea these fields of impact investing and social entrepreneurship and family office, none of that was on my radar at all. So... It is kind of interesting. I mean, I have worked in a variety of different careers and industries, and that's my ADD. I'll just get too bored if I'm in one kind of place doing one thing. The leadership development I did, that was my longest. That was 12 years in the same industry. And that was a lot of, that was we're a lot. approaching that. Yeah. Yeah, with One World, we're, you know, it's kind of nine years in. That's amazing. Shall we jump to the game? The game. The game. Okay. Well, Scott, this has been really fun chatting with you, getting to know you. But now it's time to really test you. So welcome to the Spark Tank. This is where two CEOs enter and one, only one of you gets Greta Thunberg's handshake. This week is all about social good initiatives as it relates to profitability. Mm -hmm. So in one corner, we have Scott Saslow, the impact investment guru, ready to prove that doing good is good for the bottom line. And in the other corner, we've got my brother, Rajiv Parikh, the marketing maestro, here to show us that even he has a heart or at least knows how to market to those who do. We're playing three rounds. Better than the Grinch. (laughs) Playing three (laughs) rounds of of two truths and a lie. Your task is to identify the lie. Okay, you're gonna sort of me- I'm gonna read them out. You're gonna mentally lock in your answers, and then on the count of three, you're both gonna raise your hands and give me a one, two, or three as to which one you think is the lie. All right, so let's find out who's got the business acumen to spot the feel good fib. I'm gonna dive in and find out. Here we go. Ready? Round one. We're ready. Ready. Okay. I'm gonna read three statements. One of these is a lie. Nike's Dream Crazy campaign featuring Colin Kaepernick led to a 31% increase in online sales in the week following its release. Pepsi's controversial Kendall Jenner ad 
attempting to co-opt social justice movements resulted in a 15% boost in sales in, in the quarter of its release. Or Airbnb's We Accept campaign promoting diversity and inclusion led to a 10% increase in bookings within the first month of its launch. Which, one, which of these do you think is the lie? One, oh Nike's Dream Crazy campaign. Number two, Pepsi's Kendall Jenner ad. Or num number three, Airbnb's We Accept campaign. I'm ready. Yeah. Three, two, one. Ah, time okay, for two. You both chose two and you are both yes correct that's right Oof, i'm that winning was a, that was one heck of an ad it was widely criticized tri for trivializing social issues and ultimately led to a decrease in brand yes. sentiment i, and I don't sales. remember that being popular <laughs> Didn't do colin well. kaepernick being done really well mm -hmm. and because i know someone i had a little bit of inside track on airbnb so i knew that oh, something this game like has an asterisk happened, now so sorry the Kendall Jenner was, was, was pretty rigged. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if Coke sales went up for <laughs> that. <laughs> Probably. All right. So, so far we're tied. Round number two, Starbucks Race Together campaign, which aimed to spark conversations about race relations in their stores, led to a 15% increase in coffee sales during the campaign period. Number two, Dove's Real Beauty campaign promoting bo body positivity and self-esteem led to a 700% increase in sales over a decade. Patagonia's Worn Wear program, which encourages customers to repair and reuse their clothing, led to a huge influx of new customers reporting that 70% of all Worn Wear online sales in 2022 were from first-timers. All right. I'm all ready. right. So start number Take one is Starbucks, now, number two is Dove, number three is Patagonia. Here we go. Three, two, one. Ding. Okay, Ooh. Scott thinks Patagonia's was BS. It turns out the only BS is that stuff in that Starbucks mug. Yes, Rajiv, you <laughs> did get this answer. Turns out the campaign, while it generated widespread discussion, was met with a lot of criticism for being superficial and opportunistic and having very minimal impact on sales. The real beauty one, I think, is one of the biggest winners of all time. Yeah. How, uh, I, I think that's a, a, an example of fantastic marketing where I, this was the one where they would, uh, they would have a sketch artist who would um, – talk to the per like be separated from the person through a, through a, you know a curtain and that person would describe themselves mm -hmm. and they would draw that versus how the person actually looked well <clears throat> let's get to the beauty of who wins this game round number three here we go how many rounds are there by the way this is the this is the final round so you, oh, you gotta make it up right this here is scott, your chance, scott. Um, and i do have a tiebreaker so if you do um, do make it up we got one more um all right so th these get a little a little wilder um yeah. okay a Pretty japanese company created a poop powered motorcycle so these are <laughs> sorry i should say the, the uh, all three of these are more um they're less well-known companies and they're more like ideas they had that they actually implemented versus the lie will be one that did not is is totally untrue this is not a real company that did this Got okay it. so number one a japanese co company created a poop powered motorcycle that runs on biogas generated from animal waste number two a canadian bullshit. company Got it. bullshit sorry yeah could be bullshit <laughs> Pure could be. uh <laughs> A, a Canadian company sells Unicorn Tears gin, donating a portion of its proceeds to LGBTQ charities. Or number three, a German car company launched a carpool karaoke service, offering shared rides with professional karaoke hosts with a portion of fares going to music education programs. Which of these initiatives never happened? Okay. Here we go. Three, two, one. Ding. You both said two. And you'll both be crying unicorn tears because you're both wrong. It turns out that really? that is a real, real company with a real initiative. But there's um, no the... unicorns. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> that is the brand name. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't strap a bunch of horns onto horses' heads and claim they were unicorns. Um, though I'd love to see it. It, it. it is, in fact, the German car company that 
that did not launch a carpool karaoke service that's not real sadly that's scott you did not take down my brother uh he Ugh. reigns supreme here i know Dude, it's, uh, this, this never very happens this is this, <laughs> this, this really never happens really uh so congratulations <laughs> usually you're for guess, so somewhat intelligent not today i guess do you, do you want to throw in the tiebreaker see if you can double or nothing you want to try it do, you sure. time breaker? do we have time? Now that you put that on the table, of course. <laughs> I, now we have to do it. Okay, double or nothing. This is your Here chance of beating me. Bring I, it on. I'm so used to letting my guests win. So winner take all right here if you <laughs> get it. <laughs> these, again, are more uh, more of the same of the, of the last one where these are initiatives that may or may not have happened. Okay, a company in Iceland created a beer brewed with whale testicles. <laughs> With proceeds going to marine conservation efforts. Oh, that's beautiful. A German company created a fart <laughs> wait, neutral wait, wait, underwear. Wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> why yeah. would they take the, if they're concerned about, you know, ocean health, why would they uh -huh. be messing with whale testicles? The I best way is not <laughs> to touch any whale testicles. Here's what I'm going to assume about the whale testicles is God. that it was already. They were already harvested. I assume that they're not going out hunting whale testicles. I don't even need to hear the other two. I'm, I'm just voting for one. <laughs> this is my favorite. It's my favorite round, so I'm so glad we're doing this round. You can read two and three, but I know my answer. Yeah, you're going to want to hear these. <laughs> Let's go. Number two. They're Bring all, oh, they're all as good. interesting as, and it's scatological like, as this one, actually. Very very this is very <laughs> Good look into Sandeep's subconscious. This, like this is the segment that will definitely these. be cut from the show. Okay, here we go. <laughs> A German company called or uh, created a fart neutral underwear <laughs> line that uses activated carbon filters to neutralize the smell of flatulence with with portion of the proceeds going to climate change research. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I saw that at one of uh, one of Scott's events. Uh -huh. exactly. <laughs> just, re just remember that two of these are real. Okay. Just remember that. So one of those two are real. Okay. That, okay. This yeah. Is so good. Number three. A UK company launched knitted knockers, handmade prosthetic breasts for breast cancer survivors made by volunteers and donated to those in need. These are so two of these are real. One of these is a lie. Do you All have right. your answers locked? This is in? your chance, Scott, to beat me. I'm you tie goes to the guest. Yeah, this is, this is worth two I'm points. Going number basically. one, baby. Here what we do go. you got? What Scott's got? going number one. I'm, I'm just, I want to produce an outcome, so I'm going to say three. <sighs> Amazingly, you did a produce an outcome, but the outcome was that you're both wrong. <laughs> and so Rajiv remains in the lead. And that is right, folks. Uh, this you is can right, get though. beer brewed with whale testicles with proceeds going to marine <laughs> conservation efforts. This is a real product called Havula 2 made by the Steggy Brewery. Oh, so, I love it. I love so, it. so throw one Let back if you find yourself in Reykjavik. <laughs> yeah, these are these are some they good companies that you might close their for some get, reason. Get wrecked, at, get wrecked at Reykjavik with whale and testicles. And I think awesomely, there's a, this UK company that does that does uh, knitted knockers for prosthetic breasts. A real organization with chapters worldwide. Um, but yes, I, no, I, I, I like alas, I like number two because I feel like there's a real need. Yeah, alas, so a real <laughs> it's a real blow for the to the Preek family. There is no fart neutral underwear line. So but thanks for playing. Thanks for entering the Spark Tank. Um, Rajiv, you win one. One Greta Thunberg. I'm, I'm honored to be the first guest that did not beat Rajiv. <laughs> I don't think you're <laughs> the honor. first, but, but yeah, you, you, you are in small company. <laughs> he's like, he's like, this never happens. Oh, wow. All right. All right. Well, I have a final question. In your opinion, for impact investing, from what you've seen, what makes a startup successful? Is it product adoption, usage, profitability, or are there some other ways that you measure impact? in terms of how you pick your investments and which ones uh, will be the winners for you? Because we're investing so early, we're typically seed or pre-seed. I like to say we invest in people, not products. And by that, you know, I try to take some of my talent management background and put that to work when looking at individuals and ask myself, um, you know, what are the skills they have? What are the skills they need to build to be successful in what they're doing? Um, are they aware, do they have the self-awareness that they need to build skills and are they open to it? Um, and I don't get terribly excited one way or the other about the product that they may have built because, you know, the truth is I, I want that. I need that to change. If that product doesn't change, you know, from what I'm, when I'm looking at it at a pre-seed, 
um, that that's a sign of kind of stalled progress. So yeah, I, it's kind of looking at people and, and also I would say it's trying to understand, you know, do they, is this really just in their DNA? I mean, I, I do think that's actually one of the things that make social entrepreneurs, if we can use that compared to just, you know, the general population of entrepreneurs, they are, yes, they want to be successful in, at their business. They want to make money and all these, these typical kind of things, but they're also really passionate about their cause and kind of the purpose of the company. And so my question is like, how long have they been thinking about this, right? Did they just like someone in business school mentioned some idea about XYZ market and therefore now they're in that market and they want, or if they like in high school and in, and in college and, you know, since college, have they been thinking about this area? So those are, those are kind of the things. It's like a deep seated passion. If you feel like it's exactly. a deep seated fashion, uh, passion, they're going to fight for it to the end. Exactly. Because I mean, it's a game of attrition, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's like who, who can stay alive the longest, you know? Or maybe from our mm -hmm. generation, you know, it's like Frogger, you know, you just, you got to keep going, <laughs> avoid the obstacles, you know, a little half step here, half step there. Yeah. And um, so those are kind of the things. Now that said, I, I do want to see some invention. And when I say invention, you know, it, it could be, yes, a technical invention like this one lilac, you know, they, they have a chemical process they've invented and patented, but it could be, you know, they've invented a new business model or they've invented a new way of engaging you know the the customer set or some of the major mm -hmm. players in an industry that gives them the quote unfair advantage i want to see that they've actually invented it not that they will that's that's kind of the trick with pre-seed mm -hmm. and seed is like we will do xyz you know it's like the, and then you're kind of as an investor saying like okay i'm betting on your ability Ability to create something. I, I want to see that you've created some of it already, even at the pre-seed stage, there should be some element of a creation. So, and, and you know, then, then you say, okay, well, it's a creation. It's, it's novel. Is it what the market needs? You know, does it, can it scale? You start asking those questions. So I guess I'm throwing a lot at you, but I, I'd probably say the number one is back to the person yeah. Um, and hopefully it's a team of people. I mean, we have backed kind of solo, solopreneurs, but, um, I think, you know, there's a saying that if you can't even like recruit a co-founder, that can be a flag. And so, yeah, I, I am definitely biased toward at least two co-founders. That makes a lot of sense. If you can convince at least one other person to do what you want to do with them passionately, you can change the world together. And I've seen that in some shared investments of ours. Scott, thank you for coming on our show today. We re really appreciate having you. It was so much fun. Thank and you so for much, having and so, me. And so much learning too. So I, I think you, you brought both together. So I really appreciate it. I appreciate you guys having me. I hope there's some good learnings for your listeners. It's a pleasure. I love the work you're doing. And thank you so much. All right. That was a wonderful episode with, uh, you know, that, First time author now, now first time author, Scott Saslow, right. um, multi-time, you know, multi-time entrepreneur, yeah. community builder in the fields that he's cared about. And he puts it all together. Combines oh, great. That. You're going to, you're going to steal my takeaway. I already know it. Go ahead. Fine. What's yours? You do yours yeah, first. Go first. You're younger than me. Why not? No. I, okay, oh. fine. Yeah. You know, it is, it is about the next generation. That's what I, that's what I learned about on this one. Uh, I'm the Greta Thunberg of this, uh, uh, brothership. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it was that it was the community building aspect of it, right? Like the, like, that was the piece that really resonated to me was thinking about like, hey, how are you not just uh, creating a cool product or doing something, you know, picking the right portfolio that's best for you and for you to succeed, but thinking about how, hey, how can you make sure that the entire industry that you are a part of uh, can also, you know, t uh, rise with the tides? I didn't realize uh, this whole family. I didn't know a lot about family offices till I'd say the last uh, decade. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't something they taught you about in business school. It wasn't something you even knew about when I was right. raising my first company uh, money for my first company. It hasn't really been since more recently that I came upon this understanding that there's ways in which families manage their wealth and then how they, they can take that and make that 
form the basis of a, even a, a different set of purpose and a greater sense of purpose. And when you listen to some of Scott's podcasts, if you have a chance to we'll post where, where those are, um, he's interviewing people who come from these family offices, but they have a greater purpose in life and they're trying to drive it via their family office. And that kind of innovation inside of what just typically is about al asset allocation and wealth preservation mm -hmm. is just really interesting because if you're an innovator and we're trying to spark innovators or, or highlight great innovators, you want to know where all this is coming from and who you might bump into and who you might need and how that person might make a difference in the world for you. And so Scott puts it all together in just a really interesting, unique way. And he writes this book, Building a Sustainable Family Office, all about that. Well, it really forces you to think uh, fourth dimensionally, as we would say from uh, Back to the Future, like about, about future generate, like, you know, you're not just building the thing to pay the mortgage um, or get a new pool. You're thinking about, yeah, how, how am I building something that's going to last, you know, stand the test of time and really affect my kids, their kids' kids and, and so on, you know, and what kind of world are they going to be living in? It forces you to like reframe that conversation about, you know, what, whatever it is that you're trying to build uh, in your companies. And I think that's, that's a great place to be, you know, thinking about from Jump Street. So Scott's the one that taught me about impact. It's why one of the funds that I work closely with is all about impact. And this is specifically with deep tech in India. And I never would have known about this if I hadn't gone to all of Scott's, a lot of Scott's events. And so uh, credit to him for teaching me something new and something more interesting about how you build businesses. Hopefully teaching you the same, dear listener. So thank you guys for listening. If you enjoyed this pod, take a moment to rate it and comment. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts can be found. That's right. This show is produced by Sunday Parikh and Anand Shah, production assistance by Taryn Talley, and edited by Sean Marr and Aiden McGarvey. I'm your host, Rajiv Parikh from Position Squared, an AI-based growth marketing company based in Silicon Valley. Come visit us at Position2.com. This has been an effing funny AI-based production. And we'll catch you next time. And, and remember, folks, be ever curious, but not about it. Yet.